Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Crossan, and I'm a senior health researcher at Mathematica Policy Research. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar on training practice facilitators to help primary care practices improve use of health information technology. This is the second in a series of five webinars sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality focused on primary care practice facilitation. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Next slide. Next slide. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use during the uh, webinar. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We'll try to answer these questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later through the practice facilitation newsletter, and there'll be information on how you can subscribe at the end of this webinar. We do capture all of your questions and we'll use them. A copy of today's slide deck and additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues you can also submit technical questions using the Q&A widget. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after this webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce Bob McNellis, Senior Advisor for Primary Care at AHRQ. Bob, you now have the floor. Hey, thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Uh, as Jay mentioned, I'm Bob McNellis. I'm a Senior Advisor for Primary Care at AHRQ, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and thank you all for joining us on this webinar today. As Jay mentioned, it's the second in a series of webinars, and I'm really excited today because what you'll be getting today is something special. We'll be giving you a sneak preview of the topic for two of our new modules in our coming soon Practice Facilitation Model Curriculum. More importantly, we'll hear from several experts on how to put this information into practice. Over the next few minutes, I'll provide some very brief background on ARC's interest in practice facilitation and why we think it's so important. I'll acknowledge some of the experts who've guided this work and let you know what we have in store for you today. Then I'll turn it back over to the stars of their show, our special guest. Alex, next slide, please. So ARC's mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable. We also partner with others to make sure the evidence is understood and used. Consistent with that mission is ARC's belief that primary care is indeed the foundation for a healthcare system that delivers safe, high quality, accessible, equitable, and affordable care. But we recognize that primary care is under pressure from many forces today. So we've invested in research to help understand the best approaches to support primary care practices as they transition from older models of care delivery to newer models that emphasize better patient outcomes, better experiences of care for both patients and clinicians, and help lower costs. It's clear that many primary care practices, especially smaller practices, need outside expertise, what we call an external infrastructure, to support them as they work through transformation and efforts to improve quality. We see practice facilitation as one important evidence-based strategy to assist practices as they move to new models, like the patient-centered medical home, and practice facilitation can assist with the ongoing quality improvement efforts needed to make these substantive changes. i got to give you a quick plug. Um, ARC has white papers, briefs, and other resources on all these issues at our PCMH Resource Center website, pcmh.ahrq.gov. We also know that harnessing health information technology is an important element in transformation and quality improvement. It's a critical tool for measurement, and it's been observed that if you can't measure it, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. And if you can't control it, you can't improve it. That's why the focus of today's webinar is the challenging intersection of practice facilitation and health information technology. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, much of the information you'll hear about today provides a sneak preview into two modules of a new model curriculum 
being developed by AHRQ to support the education and training of primary care practice facilitators. This new curriculum builds on our current practice facilitation handbook, which was uh, developed by Lindy Knox at LANET, who you'll hear from later, and Cindy Brock here at ARC. We're adding new modules and enhancing existing ones. We're linking them with our competencies development. We're creating an instructor's guide with suggestions about assessment. And we'll have a wealth of student resources uh, and additional information to support the delivery of the curriculum through various modalities. Expect to see this um, uh, new curriculum early next year. Next slide. So all of this would not be possible without the team at Mathematica and LANET, thanks to them, as well as our technical expert panel. This is an impressive group of experts. And on behalf of ARC, I want to acknowledge them publicly and thank them for their time and contributions to this project. Next slide. On to today's program. Here you see our agenda for the next 80 minutes or so. We're almost done with bullet number one, so we can get to the fun stuff. Next slide. And here are the folks uh, you're going to hear from today. Individually, they all are stars in the practice facilitation world, but together they represent a significant amount of expertise on the topic of training practice facilitators to help primary care practice improve the use of health information technology. And with that overview, I'll turn it back over to you, Jay, to get the ball rolling. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Bob. Next slide. Practice facilitators, as you uh, may know, are specially trained individuals who work with primary care practices to make meaningful changes designed to improve patient outcomes. They help physicians and improvement teams develop the skills they need to adapt clinical evidence to the specific circumstance of their practice environment. This, uh, this definition, uh, developed by DeWalt and colleagues, uh, frames the work that we are uh, supporting. Uh, and today's topic will focus on, as Bob mentioned, will focus in on how uh, practice facilitators can help practices better use the health information technology that they have. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lindy Knox. Hi, Jay. Thanks so much for that, and Bob, for the great introduction to the session. And I want to welcome our audience and um, start just with a brief glimpse of this module. And one of the things I would love, and I think would be a great outcome of this session, in addition to, to, to making this, bringing your awareness to this product, is if you have ideas or thoughts about what we should include in the module or resources you think are important for us to look at as we're finalizing these, because this is still a work in progress, I would love for you to share those. You can do that either through the Practice Facilitator Listserv, which Bob will mention more toward the end, or even through entering it in the Q&A section of this, um, of this platform. So let me go ahead and start. I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse into two of the modules. If you would change the slide, Alex. Uh, module 25 and 26. There's actually 33 modules that will be put together in a packet that ARC will have available on their website sometime early next year. And um, if you'll next slide, please. These two modules are focused on they're, they're for facilitators who are new to the clinical environment. They're really a, a 101. They're not designed for people who've had extensive clinical experience. They're, they're an introduction. And they're focused on building competencies really in four areas. One is to give that learner a basic knowledge of EHRs. And with this, I mean not each particular system and the unique features of that, but what is an EHR? You know, what is a GUI, that, that user interface? How does the information that a clinician or a staff person enters into it map back to a database? And all of this information is important for them to understand, both when they're trying to help develop reports around quality, um, when they're trying to validate those data, and also when they're starting to look at optimizing, helping a practice optimize their use of an EHR to support patient-centered medical home care and also meaningful use. The second bucket of knowledge that, that we're hoping to introduce them to is, is really that concept of meaningful, meaningful use in the different stages. And of course, this is a, mean, a, a moving target. So these modules are also somewhat of a launching pad to different resources and sites 
that that facilitator can go to to stay updated on what, what is the latest information in meaningful use or um, other things related to the patient-centered medical home. The third bucket is really, I think, the, the meat of it, and this is in that second module, module 26, and it's really how can a facilitator begin to support a practice, and we're thinking smaller practices, medium-sized practices, that may not have a lot of, of staff um, to do these types of things or to get them up and running. And so one area of competency that we want our facilitators to develop is how to help um, a practice generate reports that they can then use to guide care. And so this is introducing them and helping them determine which automated reports are available in their system, and then also working with them to do ad hoc or customized reports, which is, of course, a much more difficult task. The other thing that we're hoping the facilitators will be familiar with and beginning to learn to do is how to validate the data in those reports. As I'm sure all of you know, that's, that's an incredibly difficult process right now to do. With all, there's many times mapping errors and, for example, your, your metric around A1Cs, maybe part of the data stored in one part of the system, part of it in another, and so your numbers aren't correct. So helping them understand that. Also, clinical decision support. and having the facilitators know what that is and prepared to help a practice think through that, implement, and then evaluate the clinical decision supports for their practice that also align with meaningful use. And then a resource for practices that are ready to launch a patient portal and other ways to engage their patient populations with um, health IT. For more advanced practices, that might be secure messaging or telemedicine. Um, and again, these are 101, so the idea is to introduce the facilitator to these topics, but the expectation is that they will also be doing field visits with a very experienced facilitator and having a chance to observe these things firsthand. And then the final one, and of course, um, really something that with facilitators and their focus on quality improvement is probably one of the most important things, is helping practices see and frame their use of an EHR as a way to improve quality. And all of the things we just went through, the report generating, the use of clinical decision support, the engagement of patients, are all part of a quality improvement process. Um, this also includes generating performance reports both at the practice and the provider level. And again, that is something that is still very challenging to do. Um, sometimes I feel like it's, it's the mythical unicorn right now. It's so hard. Um, the final part is really how do you help that facilitator work with technical experts? Where is that line between the quality improvement facilitator and then that person that has the deep technical expertise in implementing EHRs and rips and replaces, um, and also the people that are experts at getting at the data? Um, what should that QI facilitator know, and at what point should they be able to pull those people in, and how do they do an effective handoff so they're not duplicating effort? And this is something that Allison Gossman is going to speak to us about a little bit later. Next slide, please, Alex. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of where this content is coming from. And again, I hope you all will also submit your ideas. Um, with the technical expert panel that Bob listed at the beginning of the session, also practicing clinicians and CMOs, Grace Flutes will be talking to you next. And many of the ideas are informed by her and her colleagues experiences, and they, they really keep us grounded in terms of, gee, this is what I really need. For example, she shared that one of the most helpful things a facilitator had done for her was to make a visual map of the clicks she needed to follow to enter certain kind of patient visits. And so those types of things where you take screenshots and put together a spiral-bound book that you can give to a clinician that helps them navigate their system and then can later be used to train new clinicians who come on board. Um, practice facilitator program directors have also helped us define this content, Allison Gotsman and then Anne Lefebvre and Mary McCaskill, who you'll hear from a little bit later. One of the directors of the, one of the high-tech rec centers um, also helped us, Mary Mitchell, draft some of the content for this, as well as practice facilitators out in the field like Carrie Loken. And then finally, the content was also um, gathered from the, the EHR module that was in the practice facilitator handbook that Cindy and I developed based on LA Net's experience out in the field. Next slide, please. 
and we're hoping to add you all to that list. The instructional approaches that are used in the module include didactic instruction. Um, the students also have hands-on practice finding and using these resources at the federal websites and other places across the country. The learners also are directed to have some hands-on experience with an EHR, even if that is just through one of the cloud-based systems that they can play with a little bit, really just to understand what are those different components of an EHR and how does that affect workflow, because much of workflow and practices now are clicks on an EHR or an IT system. Role-played interaction with practices, and then again, what I've mentioned before, that field experience in a practice where they have a chance to observe firsthand these activities. Next slide, please. So the following slides I'm not going to go into any detail with. They, they drill down into the content of the module. I have them here so that when ARC posts it up on the website, if you want a deeper dive into what we cover in each section, these will be available to you. But at this point, Alex, what I'd like to do is go ahead and pass through these slides and introduce to you our next speaker. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Grace Lutzis, and she is the Chief Medical Officer at Community Health Alliance of Pasadena. She is a, a close colleague of mine, someone I've worked with many years, and, and my rule in my organization is you've got to check with Grace first. Um, she's the one that really helps keep us grounded in our work and is just very much an out-of-the-box thinker. She's always ahead of the field um, in her thinking, a very proactive um, CMO. And so I'd ask Grace to come on and speak with us today and share with you some of what she would like to see. Um, first, we're going to kind of take a big picture and, and have her talk a little bit about what she sees the role of a practice facilitator being in her Federally Qualified Health Center, and then we'll talk and we'll have her talk a little bit more in detail about specifically around EHRs and health IT. But Grace, at this point, could I could I get you to take over and talk to me sure. a little bit about your what you see the role of a practice facilitator being in your organization? Yes. Um, so Chap Care is a community health center, uh, five sites and an outreach site, and we're on Epic. Um, and we're involved in a number of quality improvement projects. We have about 16,000 patients, do over 60,000 visits um, a year at all of these different sites, and the providers get to meet about once a month um, as a group. So training providers um, and keeping them informed and helping them navigate the system, both the EHR system and also all of the different quality improvement projects we have, takes a, a lot of communication. Um, currently, our, our structure allows for a site specialist, an EHR site specialist, and you'll hear about that from a lot of different organizations that once they implemented an EMR, they realized they needed someone to sort of, not just an IT person, but a, a clinical IT person who could manage um, all of the loose ends, so to speak, in the EHR and make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do and monitoring it and making sure every lab interfaced appropriately and every referral went to the right person, those kinds of details. And we also have quality improvement people, people who do work in quality improvement reports, um, data analysis. The role of the practice facilitator is really to bridge those two, to bridge the, the, the EHR site specialist, super user, and the QI person so that they understand the details of the EHR and also under, understand the detail of the clinical workflow and the overarching outcome measures that the, that the organization is getting to, the, the dashboard, so to speak, and all of other um, quality improvement um, goals the organization has. So um, I see that facilitator as someone who really uh, works closely with the QI team, with the EHR team, the super user and the site specialist, and helps, hand, you know, hands-on helps providers at each of our sites, medical assistants, front office assistants, referrals coordinators, and care coordinators manage um, to figure out how they're going to make improvements happen. Not, not necessarily figure out how to make improvements happen, but figure out how they're going to work that new workflow into their day-to-day -day so that the improvement um, has a better chance of, of of catching on and, and staying with the organization. So, uh, you know, 
one example, um, we're currently involved in a proactive office encounter project through Kaiser to improve cervical cancer screening rates. We have decision support um, in our EMR that allows the health maintenance module to show us when a pe patient is due for a pap smear. But there's a certain amount of communication with patients and with staff that has to happen, a certain amount of scripting and a certain amount of training one-on-one -on -one to make sure that from the call center to the front office to the back office staff to the nursing staff and to the provider, everyone's encouraging every time a patient comes in to get cervical cancer screening done. And um, a practice facilitator is the perfect person to understand you know, what the data has shown so far, where we are in our improvement process, and what um, each different department needs to do in order to facilitate that improvement and improve those outcomes. So they might spend a morning in the front office sitting down with front office staff saying, did you notice the health maintenance module says this patient needs a pap smear? Remember our script. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you can make it to your appointment today. We also noticed you need a pap smear. Is there anything we can do to help you get that done today? Would you like us to let your provider know you want to have that done? And of course, we can have that workflow in place so that a message can go to the provider and the back office staff without any telephone call or anybody getting up from their desk, a simple little message that allows the provider to know, not only have I seen this flagged, I also understand that this needs to get done and the patient's already been prepped you expect me to ask them about this. So that's just one simple example of how a facilitator can really be down there in the, at the ground level with staff, training staff, and understanding how the EHR facilitates and allows for practices to improve on one specific measure. Uh, an example of facilitation that I, um, that I had just in my own practice a couple days ago, um, we had been notified by, by the billing staff, or the referral staff rather, that our referrals for ultrasounds were falling through the cracks because it, in the um, EMR, that referral was being filtered out because of a little detail around who was going to make the appointment. Um, if I have the right facilitator and I have the right super user right there, they can understand what that glitch was work together, improve it, and train providers and referrals coordinators within a matter of a half hour. And that, that falling through the cracks that was going to take, in the old system, weeks to improve, a sit down, a committee, a um, you know, meeting to figure out what's going wrong, that could just be improved in, in, a, in a matter of a few minutes with an email out to all. So a facilitator, as I um, kind of going back to, is is really that bridge between quality improvement and EHR maintenance and, and, uh, and just monitoring that allows the entire practice to use the EMR as effectively as possible and quickly implement changes so that you don't get stuck in, um, in sort of long processes that don't need to take up that much time, either of staff or result in any errors. Great. I think that's Can what I, I had to can I ask you, um, now one of the things I thought was really interesting is you said you, you were reflecting on your practice and realizing that this role was missing. Yeah. Um, bridge that you're describing and that you guys were going to want to hire somebody to do that role, <clears throat> which is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, what specific skills with an EHR would they need? And I know you and I talked a little bit about, you know, how we might even get them trained in your particular system because you're using Epic, Right. Right. So can you get a little more in the weeds around specifically when you're looking at that resume of that person you're going to hire or you're getting ready to send them for training to acquire this knowledge, what specifically do you want that facilitator to know how to do with your system? Um, I think at the, at the bare minimum I'd like them to be a super user. And there is a specific super user training that our community, we're on OCHIN, so our community health center network can you know, train any um, person, MA, front office, to be a super user of the system so they understand um, a lot of the details. And EPIC's a pretty rich system, so it, it's probably not, you know, the same as a lot of the simpler systems that some of the um, smaller groups are using. But um, so they would go up to Oregon for that training. And depending on their, on, 
on who that person is and how much support they can give to the site specialist too, they may actually end up at a training at EPIC in, um, in Wisconsin, but most likely an OCHIN training around being a super user so that they understand um, the workflow very well. That's really important. And we've mapped out our workflow, but it changes. So, you know, being able to keep the workflow updated along with the other super user and the site specialist, and also understand, very important for the facilitators going to be able to understand where, re how reports are generated and what data they draw from. They don't necessarily need to be able to write the report, but they need to be able to validate the report. They need to be able to say, well, this data came from this field and that therefore is missing XYZ or is overstating XYZ, and they have to be able to do that. Great. That is very helpful and interesting. And I want to encourage um, those of you who are listening to submit questions because we'll have a Q&A um, after all of the speakers have talked. So um, please submit any questions that you have, and then we can, can ask um, Dr. Plusis and the rest of the speakers at that time. Grace, is there anything else you'd like to say before we move on? This is really interesting. I'm taking notes. I thought I'd gotten it all in the last few days, but I didn't. Super. Yep. No, I think I, I said my piece. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, next, Alex, if you go ahead and move the slide. Great. The next speakers I'd like to introduce are Allison Gossman and Carrie Loken. And Allison is formerly with Health Teamworks and now is um, one of the managers of the Colorado Health Extension System. And then Carrie Loken is a program manager at Health Teamworks and also a boots on the ground in the field facilitator. And I asked both of them if they would speak to us today about their experiences, again, preparing practice facilitators to support um, practices around EHR optimization, and then also just what it's like to be a facilitator out there doing this work. So Allison, thank you so much, and Carrie for joining us. And Allison, if you could um, go ahead and share some of the things that we, you and I had talked about, and, and one of the things that was particularly interesting is you've been doing a lot of thinking about this line between the quality improvement facilitator and then those technical experts that um, have the deep knowledge of health information technology and EHRs, and how to make good handoffs between those two, you know, what kind of relationship you need to have with the technical experts when you're doing quality improvement work. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that and, and kind of your evolution over the years with that? Sure, I'd be happy to. First of all, I want to emphasize that the line between the expert and the facilitator is never clear. Um, is a moving line. And I think my thinking, and I think in talking with others around the country, is evolving. And um, what Grace said, he, he supported completely the vision that I think for years we've all talked about the relationship of the facilitator to the practice is very similar to the practice to the patient. Um, in terms of helping practices develop self-management support, if you will. And just as we're have strongly encouraging practices to think of themselves as a team supporting the patient and no one person, our thinking in terms of facilitators supporting the practice is also now evolving to a team approach. And, and as we think about the evolution of what we expect primary care to be able to do and the complexity of the systems and the complexity and benefits that the HIT component brings, it seems intuitive that um, we will need a team. Our experience here, and I'm speaking now from my approximately 10 years of perspective with health teamwork, Way back in the day when we first started this work, um, we worked very closely with the Colorado QIO on supporting practices. They were working on the docket program, which if any of you are old enough to remember, was helping practices implement EHRs. We were working on quality improvement, which in those days was predominantly focused on diabetes or asthma. But even then, we worked with a team. 
depending on our QIOs, to have the expertise in the HIT side. Then when the regional extension centers evolved and Health Teamworks developed a team that could support the meaningful use aspect, our meaningful use team worked very closely with our practice facilitators. Now we've, um, as the meaningful use is sunsetting, Health Teamworks no longer has that internal confidence, but we're actively looking for um, technical support from our um, HIE team, which have that expertise. So the, the point here is there's, there's absolutely nothing easy about working with EHR and data. Likewise, there's nothing easy about the culture change that we're trying to move primary care to, to be patient-centered, population management, risk stratify, all those things. So we're, we're, in both cases, we're dealing with very challenging problems. And what I've observed in my experience, and there's certainly exceptions to every rule, and we can all probably point to someone that's exceptional, but my experience has been there's these two unique types of problems and unique types of problem solvers, those that are um, typically very good with the creative problem solving that are need, needed with EHRs are, are more logical, sequential, technically oriented, and can go through a checklist of things they ought to check and test, whereas the practice facilitators of the overall general simplification generally are, are better at a, at a more circuitous route, you know, being, having to adapt to the, you know, the complex adaptive systems that practices are. But the, so if you take that as a starting point, that we're going to approach this as a team, but you need to do it efficiently and effectively and respectful of the practice's limited time to focus, what we've learned over time is the importance of these two types of experts working together to serve the needs of the practice. So understanding the competence of the HIT expert and the facilitator, understanding the end goal, the practice capacity for what they can absorb, what they're ready to absorb, and what they need in their transformation process working together um, to define what what help is needed and it's got to be that that just in time help where we depend on the facilitator to have that more immediate first hand temperature of the practices ability to absorb new information and what they need so what we've evolved to over time even way back in the docket days working with our QIO is we would encourage people who are supporting a practice, whether they're in the same organization or different organizations, to huddle approximately monthly and update each other on what they've accomplished, what's on their roadmap, what they need to do next, when even to the point of when's your meeting, when's my meeting, oh, maybe we could combine that meeting and, and be respectful of the practice's time to meet with each of us. And while it's a little more complex than being able to just develop your own roadmap, your own agenda of what you want to accomplish next, um, just as any collaborative effort, it takes a little bit more time, but with these complex challenging issues, it's usually time well spent because the results are the benefit of collective thinking, collective wisdom, collective expertise. So um, that was a long way of saying that just as we want the practices to use the team approach, our experience has been that's what works best. So Allison, that's very interesting, and I love some of the details you were sharing there about having that monthly huddle and I remember when you and I were talking the other day, you also indicated you, you all were sharing assessments, kind of that initial assessment of the practice and coordinating around that too. Could you talk a little bit about that and then any other just kind of useful tools you found to help your technical experts and your QI facilitators coordinate their work? I'd, I'd love for you to just 
you know, even like a little shopping list of them would be, I'm sure, great for our audience. Well, again, it, it comes out of um, a, a core belief that if we get up in the morning to improve the U.S. healthcare delivery system, it's really the practices and the patients that are going to make the difference. So being totally respectful of their time. And so the example that Lindy was citing was um, we had one baseline practice assessment um, when we started working with practices, and the QIO had a different one, and we realized, yeah, about 85% of it were very, very similar. So out of respect for the practice time, not asking them to meet our needs for our baseline assessment and the QIO needs, it was an example of two organizations being committed to helping the practices. We came to a mutual understanding. If you're the first one in the practice and they've done your assessment, we'll use yours. Likewise, if we were the first ones in and they came, they'd use ours. We, we try to maintain that continuous respect for the limited time that practices have to attend to the transformation. Um, We've developed over time workflow diagrams and, and uh, swim lanes of handoffs, and I think those are really good guiding principles, but at the end of the day, I think that the people working together need to figure out their own approach, and I think Terry is probably in a better position to talk specifically about that. My perspective has always been how do I, as, as a leader, organize the resources that the teams need? And as I said, my bias has always been, and it gets more and more complex, it's reaffirmed, that no practice facilitator can be expected to have all the competencies that the practices need access to these days. So thinking about supporting practices as a team is, is something I think I've intuitively known, but I've become more conscious of articulating it. And just as within a practice, the many practices huddle every morning to figure out how they're going to provide the best care for the patients they expect to see that day, we strongly encourage our teams to huddle to provide the best support they can for the practices that they're mutually working with in the idiosyncratic uh, strengths are a factor of the people that are collectively working to support the teams. Great, Allison. Well, thank you so much. And that's a, that's a nice segue to Carrie. Um, and, and I share your evolution toward the team-based approach. So, you know, LANET started really with just the QI facilitator and rapidly realized that we needed a team. And so we've looked very carefully both at what Anne's been doing in North Carolina and you all did at Health Teamwork. These technical experts as also facilitators on the team. Um, Carrie, do you have any thoughts or reactions that you want to share to what Allison just said? And then you're, you've been a boots on the ground practice facilitator out there. And so I also wanted you to share some with our audience about kind of what you found to be the most important things you needed to know about um, EHRs and then how you acquired that knowledge. So, so thank you very much. And um, the only thing that I'd like to add to um, Allison's um, thought process or what she shared on the call so far is that um, we also try to make sure if one member of our team has been in a practice that the um, other folks going into the practice are aware that um, they've been there and what they covered with them. Again, trying to be respectful of the practice's time and continue to build and reinforce on um, what our team member um, has said or um, facilitated in that practice. So. Um, we, we try um, to do that on a regular basis if someone's been in and document that in a place where everyone ha in our team has access um, to see where they've been. Um, in terms of um, what I think is important for a practice facilitator to know around EHRs, um, I think varies very much by, re by region. And um, 
as the first speaker spoke of, they're looking for someone with very specific epic knowledge who's a super user um, because they're hiring a practice facilitator in their system. Um, for us in Colorado and in health teamworks in particular, um, you know, I was working with 17 practices and they were on 14 different EHRs. So I could never be a super user or an expert on all on 14 different EHRs and be able to accomplish my primary goal of using data that comes from those EHRs um, to help improve workflows, processes, population management, and that kind of thing where that's really truly my expertise in um, facilitating discussions around that. So um, I, again, I think it's going to vary by region and um, who who you're really working for. Um, we're a nonprofit. Um, organization who is helping many different practices in many different systems. Um, so for us um, and our quality improvement coaches or practice facilitators, we really want our coaches to have a basic um, understanding of what an EHR should be able to do. They should be able to report uh, meaningful use reports. Um, that should be good data. Um, they should be able to um, either have a registry or find out from the practice that's, that lives within the HR or find out from the practice if they use a standalone um, registry. Um, just the general basic functionalities that all EHR should have if they're ONC certified. Um, I think it's what we what we coach our own coaches to and many coaches that come to uh, attend our Coach University program is that you don't want to really kind of go down that bunny hole of the EHR because a lot of times your entire um, quality improvement meeting is focused on um, the click and that work should really be done outside of that meeting. Um, so you can focus more on the workflow and if needed, table that discussion and come back to it the next time once it's been determined where to click, where to enter the data, how to pull the report, or if it's even reportable. Um, I think it's really important to know who your resources are. Um, so in Colorado, um, we have peer-to-peer -peer, um, resources. So we may connect a practice that's on eClinicalWorks to another practice who's on eClinicalWorks that might be a more advanced user or figured something out. Um, we've also convened EHR community calls um, across our programs to allow practices on like EHRs um, to talk to each other through a facilitated conversation. We're also working towards um, getting vendors on those calls to find out is it really a user issue or is it a technology limitation. Um, and I think coach um, or facilitator spread, so learning from one practice, um, and taking that to the next practice or talking coach to coach. Um, using our local rec partners, um, as Allison indicated earlier, our QIO, there are independent contractors you can connect practices to. Um, there's the VARs um, and, of course, the local HIE. Um, and sometimes we just direct them right back to their EHR. If nothing else works, um, we um, will provide them sometimes write the language um, for them um, to send as a, as a ticket um, to their EHR because they don't quite know how to ask the question, um, but the EHRs are typically very unresponsive to us. We're not their customers. We're never going to be their customers, so um, it's best they'll, they'll respond to a practice versus us, but sometimes the practices just don't know what the right way to ask the question is, so we'll provide them, you know, really um, the email to send. So in terms of how I um, obtain that knowledge, so we at Health Teamworks have a Coach University program, um, so that's really the base of the knowledge. Um, I think you learn a lot in the field from practices. Um, you will find that there are some things that work from one EHR to another and some things that don't. Um, and it's just in our, our approach in, in coaching practices at all is really asking the questions and teaching them to fish. And so it's okay if you don't know and you ask, um, and then that brings you, you know, to the next why. Well, why doesn't that work? And um, so on and so forth. Um, we did have and, um, and are continuing to pursue um, and have resources at our organization for HIT support. So um, I'll give an example of how we might use that. 
um, in one of the programs we support, there, there's a heart failure uh, measure regarding beta blocker um, usage. And pretty much no practice, regardless of their EHR, was able to report um, on that measure. So I contacted Kellen, our HIT guru, and I'm like, Kellen, no one's be able to get this measure. Why might that be? And so she um, gave us some ideas of why that might be. So then we could go into the practice and say, okay, talk me through it. What's going on? Um, how do you get the data? You know, in this circumstance, it turned out that in most cases the um, EF result was a scanned result, and so it wasn't being entered into a discrete data field. So then it was talking through, well, do you know where to – where what – what could be the workflow around that? And it was typically that when the result was received, an MA would enter the result into a discrete data field. In one practice, it still wouldn't report, even though they were entering it in the field that seemed to be right. Um, and so we um, sent, you know, called our HIT folks up again, said, any ideas? And in that case, they, ref they directed us to the EHR. Um, the, contact, the practice contacted the, e, um, the EHR, and um, they told them where to put the data. I would love to say that the EHR got it right, but even they didn't know where to put the data to get the report to pull, and it took about three or four different um, PDSA cycles to get that um, into the right data field um, so that that report would pull. So that's kind of an example of using multiple resources um, to get a, a resolution to the problem. Carrie, that's fantastic. What what interesting information. So let me let me ask you. I'm going to ask you a question out of left field here. Um, don't hate me, but if I were a brand new facilitator starting, and I came to you and I said, Carrie, I need some guidance. What are the three things that you would advise me to do to be to start being prepared to support practices around their EHRs and health IT? Um, and one of them I heard is, is don't fall down the bunny hole. Um, what, but give me, a, like, three specific things you'd advise me to do if I was just beginning this work, just learning to do these things. So I, number one is exactly what you said and what I indicated either. Don't go down the bunny hole. Practices will try, um, some practices um, will try to suck you down and try to make you the expert on their EHR and do the work for them. Um, and we, um, as Allison um, shared with you on our, our prep call, we used to do that. We used to do the clicks, um, and we used to do the work. Um, and then, you know, eventually they need to be able to stand on their own without the coach in the practice. We're not going to be there on a day-to-day -day basis to do the clicks and do the work. Um, so I think that that's number two is don't do the work for the practice. Teach, um, Learn how to ask strategic questions to get them um, to the answer that you think um, is the right path. I think that two things. One, it becomes their idea, and so they're, um, I think, typically more bought into it um, because they came up with their own solution. Um, and B, um, it just reinforces teaching them, um, as Allison loves to say, to fish, to figure it out on their own. Um, our role is to facilitate the conversation, not to provide the answers. Um, and I think the third thing is is um, to continue to push practices um, to resolve the issue, not to give up, um, because a lot of times it's, it is frustrating. For ex the example that I shared where the practice contacted their EHR and they said, well, put it here, they did a whole bunch of work, changed where they put it, vested it a lot of time, and it turned out not to be the right place, and that information came directly from the EHR. So it would be easy to give up and say it's never going to work and we're not going to have this data. Um, but continuing them to, to pursue um, the answer. I, I always talk about, um, you know, it's a lot of investment and I'm not trying to minimize the time and resource investment to get your EHR to work the way you want to, but the data that it can provide you to guide improvements in your practice um, are so powerful that it's you know, worth that time, and don't try to fix everything at once. Focus on one thing, get a win, um, you know, get your process in place, and then go on to the next one. You don't have to, um, you know, get it all done in one fell swoop, but 
to continue to them um, to coach them to persevere and and win the battle with their EHR, which they really do a lot of times feel like it's a battle. This is Allison. I can't help but jump in and add one more tip I would give to a new facilitator would be to get to know the strengths and expertise and knowledge and background of your team members. And when you encounter something that you aren't familiar with, learn who's got that knowledge and call on your team. And don't feel you have to know it all. I, I, you know, as you can all tell, Carrie is very competent and very experienced. But I know from observation, she calls on her team too, even though she's been at this for years and she's very, very good. Right. I wow. echo that. Thanks for bringing that forward, Allison. Allison and Carrie, thank you guys so much. And I'm going to be interested in the discussion section to also get Grace's thoughts about the bunny hole, because I think there, there are probably different perspectives on that, and it will be interesting to talk about that. Right now, I'd like to move on, though, to um, our next speaker. And she is, um, Alex, if you could forward the slides for me, please. Um, Mary McCaskill, and Mary is from the North Carolina AHEC program. She's the health IT manager there, so she's coming at this from the technical expert's perspective. Um, and I've had some really fascinating conversations with Mary, um, one of them being around the, the, just the great challenges we're still facing trying to get to those, those data that Carrie were talk, was talking about. And so, Mary, I'd like to, to one, welcome you to the, to the program and then ask you to talk a little bit about um, what you do in North Carolina, what some of the biggest challenges you think your facilitators are facing when they work with the EHRs, and how you're addressing these and preparing your facilitators to, to, to tackle these. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And hi, Lindy. Thanks for having me on the call today. Um, and I just want to say I really appreciate all the comments and um, insight that the other speakers have, have brought to the conversation. Uh, we have um, kind of three big challenges that, that we face in uh, the, the quality improvement work that we do. Um, the first one being um, in when practices were kind of implementing and configuring um, EHRs, then they were doing so uh, kind of for regulatory compliance to meet meaningful use, um, to start in the PQRS program or e-prescribing program. And so they were kind of... Um, they started their EHR journey sort of um, in that uh, direction rather than kind of looking at their own strategic objectives. So I know one of the challenges we have is when we go into the practice, then that was kind of how they set the EHR up rather than uh, sort of setting it up in a way and the workflows in a way that helps them out the most. So some of the things we have to do when we first go in are kind of align what their goals are um, with how the EHR is configured. And, and to do that, sometimes it's difficult, um, it's a challenge because they don't have uh, access to help IT staff that are um, knowledgeable either in their EHR or they haven't had adequate training when we come in. So, um, so that makes it difficult as well uh, when we come in to start working with the practice. Mary, could I could I ask you? Can I can I interrupt just a minute? And could you give me a like a, a specific example when you're talking about you go in and and they've set up their system one way, and then you're working with them to align that. You're working both with your tech experts and your QI experts, right? Correct. To do this? Mm-hmm. And right. do, you, um, do you think of a particular case or practice example where you did that? Um, like what was the practice's goal and, and what needed to be realigned? Right. I think one of the places we see it um, – kind of amplified is in the referral process. I've been in um, quite a few practices that sort of set up the referral practice and, and a referral um, workflow sort of based on, on the meaningful use criteria rather than, and then they'll still have a duplicate workflow to make sure that they're really, you know, crossing all their P's and dotting their I's to make sure that everything's taken care of. So they never really adapt their previous workflow to the electronic health record. Does that sort of answer? So what, what have you done when you've encountered that in a practice? How do you help the practice realign that or integrate those two processes? 
uh, really just starting down and, and documenting the workflow, their um, their current workflow, and then maybe their their non-electronic workflow, and then documenting how that's going to work, um, where the different uh, clicks are, what the different roles are within the practice, and how how those work together. Great, thanks, Mary. And you've got a couple of slides also that you wanted to show, so be sure and tell Alex to move the, the slide deck when you're ready to talk about them. Okay. Um, actually, if you want to go ahead and forward the slides, um, probably the, the uh, third and probably the biggest challenge that we have is uh, collecting data. Um, since improvement really is driven by data, um, it's it's kind of a moving target at times. So on the slide I've outlined, we've been collecting data from our practices um, and documenting it since 2008. So it was it was really great to be able to see over time sort of how that has evolved. With we started out using a uh, registry and had folks reporting that way, and then we. Um, kind of moved with Meaningful Use Stage 1, kind of moved into the canned reports. And as you can see, in about um, January 2013, that's when we kind of hit, hit our highest point of um, our participating practices. So we document um, particular, excuse me, participating practices and kind of um, the fact that they're active and that we've met with them each month. And then we also report clinical data. So what the graph shows is that over time, the um, the um, excuse me that we're not getting as much um, clinical data as we were before um, because meaningful use uh, when we started using the meaningful use stage two canned reports, if you look over to the left of the slide, you can kind of see some of the reasons um, toward the bottom that. Um, we were having difficulty. A lot of the uh, vendors implemented uh, clinical quality measures that were based on the end uh, meeting fees reporting period rather than uh, the time frame for actually that we were tracking with improvement. So that's kind of big. Um, then our biggest challenge over time is getting reliable data and timely data from from the EHRs, and I I think. Um, it was Carrie that mentioned earlier that they had about 10 EHRs that they work, 10 to 20 EHRs that they work with, and we have about 100 that we work with across the state. So it makes it difficult from vendor to vendor to figure out how to uh, pull those reports. So that sounds like a massive challenge, Mary. How how are you? How do you handle that in your program? 100 different systems. I'm getting a stomachache. <laughs> oh my! How, how do you um, how do you test that? How do you deal with that? Well, one of the ways, and, and really we're working on it now, is is really realizing that uh, the, the meaningful use stage two K reports are making it difficult for us to get the um, get that data out. Is really identifying the EHRs that we can and can't get the data from, and we're also working really hard to. Uh, since we've got such um, great, smart, and talented uh, consultants in the field, kind of uh, making sure we're sharing the knowledge across across our consultants to make sure that um, folks have the skills that they need in pulling the data from the different EHRs. Great. Thanks, Mary. Now, did you have a second slide? Or just this one? I did advance the slides. Um, this is more uh, kind of considerations in working within the practices for, uh, and I think um, staff, both practice and facilitator, kind of uh, learn within the practice um, how, to, how to pull the data and how the EHR works within that practice. So I think these kind of um, apply to both both groups of people. Um, the first thing is that they have no fear and start small. Uh, when the first quality report I tried to run in a practice um, was, I, I looked at it and the denominator asked for 
a segment of the population that um, had been seen for a particular diagnosis twice over the reporting period. So, you know, when I went into the EHR, there was really no way without any advanced analytics products to be able to do that. So I think if you kind of walk into it expecting, you know, big results, then you might be a little bit disappointed. And like Carrie said, you really have to keep at it. So starting small, you get those small wins, and it makes it easier to move forward. Um, again, or uh, specifying the reporting criteria, so uh, using the um, standardized uh, clinical quality measures from um, either the ECQMs or NQF measures, they're good because they're already uh, based in evidence and they're already uh, kind of formulated within the EHR. And we talked about Grace talk. Um, it was great to hear um, Grace talk about uh, how in her practice they're really either defining talent or hiring talent to, um, to cover the health IT issues that they have. Um, obtaining vendor-specific documentation is important because it's really a roadmap on how that specific EHR works. And also, there, I think at this point, there's a lot of folks going to um, like add-on products. I know eClinical Works has an analytical platform, or the Health Information Exchange might have analytics. Um, also, uh, I think vendor management is really, really key in keeping a good relationship with your vendor and having someone that's in the practice that, that does that. Make sure that um, everything is in writing in the, in the contract first of all, to, um, to kind of keep everybody on the same page. Uh, getting to know your account representatives or support staff. I don't know how many times I've been in a practice and they say, you know, I couldn't get anybody to call me back from XYZ vendor, but now I have John's name and John's direct number, so now I'm able to, uh, to get things done. Um, and being able to understand what the escalation points with a vendor of, of – um, of if I'm not getting a call back or my issues aren't being resolved, what's the next step? And also with that, keep a list of spreadsheet of uh, logged issues so that you'll know what you've reported in the past and kind of keep track of what's been fixed and what has not. I think those are important. Great, Mary. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, is there anything else, Mary, that you wanted to, to touch on before we move on to the QA? part of the process? Uh, no, I think that was what I had. Great. Well, and I think that vendor management piece is is, um, is very interesting. And I heard um, Carrie talking a little bit about that, even where they were writing the, the request, helping the, the practice craft some of those to, to be able to ask the question and get the, the right information that they needed. So, um, and then you and I commiserated quite a bit on it's almost gotten harder to get to the data now than it was even a few years ago. So um, I have to share that, that frustration. So now we'll shift at this point in the program to questions, and please um, submit any questions you have for the speakers or anything else that you'd like to talk about. Um, there's a Q&A widget at the bottom of your webinar screen to submit your questions. So the more that you put into the, the Q&A process right now, the more interesting it can be. I wanted to start, though, first and get Grace's reaction to Carrie's discussion about the bunny hole and what she was thinking as Carrie was talking about the need to stay more hands-off with the, the EHR work. Grace, did you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm muting. Um, I, well, I think it really, I mean, it, it's really, sep it's very different if you're hiring your own quote-unquote facilitator versus if you're um, part of a rec that's going out to different practices and trying to help build those skills in two or three identified staff. Um, so I think there is that distinction. And then there's a separate distinction because even within the practice, I certainly agree that the facilitator should not take over the role of site specialist or super user, that they're separate roles. And the facilitator is really there to work with staff to help them understand what the improvement goals are and what the workflow to get to improvement is. So not even to design the workflow necessarily. That, that might happen through, you know, a group effort or a team effort with 
you know, three or four people, but that once that workflow is in place, that really helping to motivate and to inspire staff to keep doing it and to monitor it and to look at the data is the facilitator role. But for us, a facilitator who has a limited understanding of the of the tool of Epic is going to be very, um, it, it's, it's going to be almost more work than they're worth because we'll constantly be explaining why we do things the way we do or what the limitations are or what the expectations are. And I really agreed with the speaker who said that we should never accept no for an answer from our vendor. I, I can't say that often enough to my staff and also to the vendor themselves. It's like it's gotta be it's gotta be possible. There's a way to get it done. It may be not worth doing because it's too expensive or we can't put the resources into it, but don't tell me it can't be done. Because that's you know, obviously I have to be able to know how many of my patients are on a beta blocker. So I, I think the bunny hole is a it, it needs it's a fine a fine line and I think it needs to be very um the roles um, and responsibilities need to be well established and almost I think if you're coming from the outside to help a practice facilitate um, improvement, I think you really need to have that as part of the MOU or the understanding obviously and I'm sure that's what happens in, in those places. But we do rely a lot on EPIC to help us get where we're going and so I think a, a, some understanding of our system is going to be needed from a facilitator if they're going to come in and do real improvement work with us. Carrie, do you have any thoughts in response to Grace? No, I definitely agree. And I think, again, it, it depends on the approach and the purpose of the practice facilitator um, and, and their role. And we do see um, in our, even in Colorado, there are systems that are hiring their own um, practice facilitators and training them, and, and for them it would make sense. And um, as a practice facilitator in one of those systems, and there's some that come to our Coach University where, yes, they definitely know the EHR, and then I think it's coaching them, um, as Grace said, not to do the work, not to create the workflow, but to be able to be there as a support to determine whether or not the EHR can do it, and if it can't, being that person to go to the EHR or another resource um, inside the system, taking it to them to take to the EHR um, to get it resolved. So um, that's when you coach to, yes, it's important for you to know, um, and you can participate in the conversation, but it should really be the practice themselves that comes up the, with the workflow. So I think it makes very much sense. Great. Thank you for that, Carrie. So we have a couple of questions here, um, and one is, do practices, and I think it's very salient to what we're just now talking about, do practices become dependent on practice facilitators as their technical health IT support system? If not, where does the role of the health IT system support person and the PF interface? How do they negotiate their respective roles? So what is the, where does the role of the health IT system support person and the practice facilitator interface? Or do practices become dependent on the practice facilitators as their IT support system, and, and this may be particularly an issue in, in smaller practices. Um, do any of our audience, any of our speakers, have a, a response to that question? Mary, how what how would you respond to that? Um, Are you on mute, Mary? I'm here. Um, I think it's. I think it's real important to kind of define that at the beginning and that what the different roles will be because, of course, we see, and it's really more based on consultant, um, either temperament or personality as to how much they kind of give the practice. And so really having the defined roles at the beginning is important. So, how do you Allison. Allison. I, oh, go ahead, Allison. Oh, I was just going to say, we we did fall into that trap in the beginning because practice facilitators, by the very nature of the people who are successful, like to help people. And they see these very busy practices, and they've got the ability to do it, so they jump in. We learned painfully that that doesn't help the practice in the long run. It is, I'm sure we're not unique in saying that our our responsibility is to teach them to fish. But I, I agree with Mary in trying to clarify 
but I think the real solution lies in going to the the root cause and helping them find out what they need and who the appropriate supports are for them, whether they've got another neighboring practice in the community that's um, more of an expert that they can look to, whether their vendor can do it, or whether you have to go to senior leadership and say, you need to hire somebody with this expertise. But it's um, it's easy to fall into that that trap, but I think there are mechanisms to avoid it. And the practice facilitator, I think, has to be able to be reflective on what's the what's their ultimate purpose is to allow the practices to be self sufficient and help them figure out the means to get there. You know, I mean I, I think that's ultimately a, a great goal that for some of the very small solo and, and two or three practitioner practices, um, I think the concept of a an outside external facilitator is gonna is not going to disappear after, you know, two or three months or six months, and that self-sufficiency um, is going to take up much longer. It's going to be need to be built in and integrated into the, the care delivery system much better before those practices can function without some help. So I think understanding, you know, what IT support they have when you walk in the door is going to be critical. Like you, you can't just go in and say, "Well, here's what you need," and then and come to the understanding, you know, three months later that they haven't had any IT support <laughs> since they, you know, plugged this in, this box in. So, I think getting them to understand where they're, you know, slowly where they're going to need to be with HIT is part of the, because they are going to need to be self-sufficient on their HIT piece, at least, if not on QI. Right. Thank you, guys. So we've had several people asking, how do you actually get experience using an EHR if you're a practice facilitator? Are there different simulators? Or um, you know, I know that High Tech LA had used Practice Fusion was one of the, the resources they used because you could set up a free account and then kind of um, navigate the system and, and have their folks learn a little bit about it. Um, are there other ways that, that our speakers would recommend having facilitators get some hand-on hands-on exposure to EHRs. Allison and Carrie, how have how have you all provided that? This so is Allison. Go ahead, Carrie. Um, this is Carrie. So. Um, we haven't, um, and I and Allison can speak more to the early days of health team marks than I can. But um, from my experience, we didn't get in and do um, experiment with an EHR. I can say that I think um, probably all of our coaches, myself included, have sat down side by side with a practice and set up reports. Um, done a, I'll give an example for their one practice. They were. Um, had upgraded their EHR, all of their reports and how they pulled them changed, even though they were on the same EHR, just a newer version. So we did a go-to meeting with our HIT um, person on our team, myself and the um, practice manager, sat down and rebuilt their reports. And so sometimes just through the nature of the QI meeting, um, you know, somebody might put up on the screen if we're projecting or after the meeting, just side by side, um, working with the practice. So I think that's where, at least currently, the bulk of our experience in EHRs has just been sitting shoulder to shoulder with someone in the practice. This is Allison. What I would add to that is certain practices you get to become um, very close, trusted colleagues. And I have certainly had some experiences where the practices have given me a username and password and have trusted me to work only within, you know, patient Mickey Mouse that has no real data in it and have allowed me to play with it to learn what the templates look like, what the reports look like, how do you document when you document this, what do you see in the dashboard. Um, so that comes from a trust that you can be respected to honor 
all the requirements for HIPAA and PHI and that you will not mess with any real data but limit yourself to, to Mickey Mouse. A couple of other practices have whole segments that they use for training and they'll, um, some of the more sophisticated have a whole training instance that they use for staff and they will allow facilitators whom they've gotten to know and trust to negotiate in those arenas as well. Great. Other other thoughts or ideas from our, our speakers on that issue? So Grace, I have a question specifically for you, and, and I think it's an interesting one. I think it's, it's um, one that perhaps all the speakers can eventually respond to, but particularly interested in, in your response of how are you overcoming any, how will you or how are you overcoming any resistance to the extra cost of bringing a practice facilitator on board? Um, can you talk a little um, bit about that? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, our our vendor, which is a health center controlled network, has sort of a recommendation about what the the requirements of a practice are to support their side of the EHR. And so because we kind of enter into a partnership as we enter into our EMR, it's not um it's not strictly a you know, we're going to buy this and then we're going to ask you for help whenever we need it. I mean, there's an agreement that we're going to provide X amount of support. And and we have some of that key staff in place, but we have openings for other key staff. And so, and we also have openings for a clinical QI person. And so I'm sort of, you know, saying instead of a separate clinical QI person and a separate super user, I want to create this new position that really bridges those two and allows more of the nit and gritty work to get done at at the level of seeing patients. And one of the huge obstacles we have to really, um, you know, making a breakthrough in, in improving care is this need to get people into a room to explain it to them. Like nothing, you know, or email them and have them sit down and read it or read this training and, and they're away from patient care. And right now, patient care has to always be the priority. Access is the priority because, you know, every month we're seeing about 400 new patients under the Affordable Care Act. We can't pull people out constantly to be training them or to be um, motivating them to do new improvement projects. So this person is really supposed to to come in there and know your work and sit down with you and help you see it as you do it and um, and understand, you know, the workflow and understand also the the EHR and its potential, but also have the bigger picture of what the quality improvement is about and what the, and what the data is showing. So, you know, maybe it's pie in the sky, but I think that's the idea I have. And the senior, I, I don't have to take that to the board, but senior leadership is very, um, supportive of that type of work getting done and really wants to see improvement happen. So I don't have that hard a struggle on that one. And it's, and it's roles, it's really um, rethinking current positions and roles. It's not, you know, necessarily more money. Chris, thank you for that. Any reactions from our speakers, um, other speakers, or questions from the audience on that issue? So here's another um, a question that, that has come up a couple of times, and it's that issue of vendors telling practices that um, customizable means that they don't have to modify, modify workflows. <laughs> so can the speaker speak, talk a little bit about their experience with um, the customizability of EHRs and its impact on workflows in practices? How customizable are they really? And how have you handled that with your facilitators? This is Carrie. And um, again, I think that how customizable they are varies by each EHR. Some of them have add-ons that you can buy. Some of them just allow a lot of um, user um, ability to customize some um, have no customization. So I think it's the question within the 
um, assessments. And I agree with Grace earlier when she says you absolutely need to know, and I think Mary touched on it and Allison, what resources are in the practice, how, um, you know, who are your super users, who has expertise or interest in different areas. And so um, I think that that's an important, um, it's really going to be based on, and sometimes the customization can be extremely helpful in the practice. Um, and sometimes when a practice starts to customize, it can really start to create some problems and you have to kind of do some um, uh, backtracking. So um, I don't know if that helps to answer that question or not. Any other reactions from our speakers? Um, this is Grace. And I, um, when, you know, we have a, a lot of practices come to see our implementation as they're considering um, whether or not to to do EPIC and through a community health center controlled network. And so I, it's my experience that um, nobody's workflow is so great that they should assume that they need to customize their EHR to that workflow. Um, it, that's almost never the best strategy. And if a facilitator can even just help a practice see that through an implementation that, look, you know, this cervical cancer screening workflow tracking system right here that you've got that's built in, that's really well tested and that's been user, um, you know, validated is going to be better for you than any workflow you've come up with on a previous system that hasn't been tested on this system or on paper. And most people, you know, at this point we're seeing people go from system to system, which is a whole different implementation issue. But I, I think customizable is useful to a certain degree, like for, and, but it isn't, I mean, it is really not what makes a system great or perfect or, or the best um, system for a practice. And so I, I, don't think being customizable doesn't necessarily help you do good care or improve care, especially when it comes to reporting and having standardized reports that you can really rely on. All of that is actually somewhat um, hurt by systems that call themselves really customizable. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, and it it makes me want to ask you the question of what makes the system great for a practice, but I realize that we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to have you all back on. We have a time for one more question, and um, one of our audience members was asking, a, I think, another very important question is, if you can't get the data out of the EHR for quality improvement, how do you start quality improvement work with your facilitators at that site? Um, could our speakers respond to that question? Well, this is Allison. I'll jump in um, because that was certainly very much um, the way in the beginning when people didn't have the HRs. took a while to get their registries up. And we reverted to the age-old chart pools as much as they hated it. Um, we, it was something we found that until they actually saw the data, they didn't feel compelled to change their processes. And so whether you, you know, ideally, of course, you want to pull it as a byproduct of the work they're doing, but we found that chart pulls were what we needed. And I, I found Mary's slide about the amount of clinical data that they're able to get now as, as EHRs supposedly evolved is less. That's been our experience here, although we don't have we haven't documented it. It's anecdotally we're banging our head against the wall and feeling it. But um, we have actually resorted to chart polls. So that I'll stop there and see what others have to, to say about it. But foundationally you've got to have the data from some source. How would other speakers respond to that question? If you can't get to the data that you need for the improvement work, how, how do you begin work with the practice? Carrie, how would you handle that? I was waiting for others because I know I always have an opinion and didn't want to. <laughs> 
we'll it, take over the call. So I think Al Allison brings up a good point. There's always the um, old chart pulls. I think um, at least with most practices we're working with now, um, there's some data. One report might be broken, but we can use another. So it might be a shift in focus while we're resolving the data issue for this measure. Um, measure B is working, so let's 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 go work on that, or let's maybe work on something that might not need data, um, because there are a few of those, or data that might be practice recorded um, data. Um, so just shifting the focus. Um, while the while you're resolving whatever data issue you're having, so either using practice reported data, used, working on a process that might not require EHR data, or using um, data from the EHR that is good and and starting there instead. Great, Carrie. Thank you very much for that. And now we are, our time for Q and A has ended. If your question wasn't addressed. Um, I know that our team will be sending answers back um, either through the system or, or through your email after this, after this event. But I'd like to pass the baton now back to Bob from ARC and Bob McNellis and Jay Croson, please. Great. Thank you, Lindy. Wow, fantastic job. What a wonderful discussion. Uh, great job with the Q&A. And, and certainly on behalf of ARC, uh, let me thank all of our guests today. So Grace Flutzis, uh, Allison Gottsman, Carrie Lakin, and Mary McCaskill, thank you all very much for taking the time to, to join us today and to share your expertise uh, uh, and insights. Uh, this was great. So for this uh, summary, I'm not sure I can do um, uh, this uh, nice conversation justice, but um, I, just to, to, to reaffirm a little bit what I heard today is, is, as to what we learned is, first, you know, what are some of the most important things practice facilitators can do to help uh, a practice with HIT? And actually, perhaps the first one that I heard was to help the practice reaffirm the goal is, is really to deliver high quality patient care is really the reason we're, they're, they're undertaking all of these efforts. Uh, second, it's important to be respectful of practices time and coordinate those efforts with, with the HIT teams as much as possible. Uh, Grace really talked a lot about, and I think, and Allison reaffirmed this idea of the bridge um, uh, serving to connect not just the EHR experts and the QI staff, but the clinical staff as well, and the PFs can play an important role in that. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, um, uh, teaching the practice how to fish, making them self-sustaining in their practices. Where are some of the sweet spots for working with HIT experts? Well, certainly building on the concept of the bridge a little bit. I thought I heard a lot about sort of huddles. Um, this really, I love this analogy of the team-based approach to facilitation and QI as being analogous to, uh, to, to team-based care that we're promoting uh, so strongly today uh, to deliver better care. And also, I think understanding the resources you have in the community, both either on your team, uh, other PFs who are working with other practices, I'm just imagining. Uh, dealing with uh, 100 practices in your community, as Mary mentioned, and uh, boy, you really have to draw on those resources to, to really make those connections. And finally, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, you can anticipate? Um, well, I, I heard a little bit about dealing with vendors um, um, and um, uh, a little bit also about the mismatch between uh, reporting requirements that are sometimes built into EHRs and, and how they're mismatched from the QI efforts and tracking those efforts. Um, that there are challenges with keeping the focus on workflows as we go through things. But perhaps the most important uh, uh, challenge we heard is don't go down the bunny hole. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a good one to, to end this with. So, so Jay, I'm going to turn it back over to you for the last words today. Okay. Um, next slide, please, Alan. Um, and I also want to uh, second Bob's uh, thanks to everyone who uh, contributed to the call and to all the people who uh, we're here listening and observing the webinar and submitting their questions. And I want to encourage you to save the date for the next webinar, which will be December 18th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, where we'll talk about how practice facilitators can work with practice leadership to support a patient safety culture. And registration details for that webinar will be coming soon. Um, for ongoing updates and more information about practice facilitation, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to our practice facilitation listserv at uh, the address that you see there on your screen and just include subscribe in the subject heading and you will get regular uh, practice facilitation newsletters with updates about training topics and other issues of concern to practice facilitation. We have a number of case studies of exemplar uh, practice facilitation training programs available online at the link that you see there um, and as a resource as part of this webinar. 
And that can also give you some ideas about how to uh, implement some of what we've talked about today and how to get uh, people trained to do this work out in the field. And, I'm, and uh, thanks to everyone for your attendance and for your participation in the webinar.